and uh, uh, Ulf and e, Ulf E. Andersson and the E is important because both Ulf and Andersson are common Swedish names. <laughs> uh, and uh, he is the vice president currently and of the National NGO Swedish Space Society, Svenska Um He has been uh, the president for quite a while as well. Uh, he's also CEO of the consultancy Swedish Future Scanning, looking at uh, how different futures could look. And he has worked as an innovation strategist for more than a decade at the Swedish National Environment Protection Agency and uh, a number of government offices, national agencies and think tanks. And if I missed something, Ulf, uh, please feel, feel free to fill me in. And otherwise... I have two daughters. You didn't say that. Sorry? Uh, I, I have two daughters. You didn't say that. And he has two daughters, <laughs> not to forget. Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the floor, the air, and the ether is yours, Ulf. Okay. Thank you, Niklas. And thank you for this uh, nice presentation. And, and thank you uh, also, Ben, uh, for letting me be part of this interesting conference. So I will talk about uh, sustainability. Uh, new technology and smart systems that could be used on the moon and also on Earth. So I will start to share my presentation, hopefully. And yes, you are. Thank you. Yeah. And proceed. And uh, you all see the first slide. Uh, I think this is some sort of, of a vision that we all share that uh, should happen uh, sooner or later. Maybe not uh, as a frontier society, but a, a long range vision. Uh, a city or a place where, where we have all, uh, where people actually live. And as opposed to the previous uh, speakers, I think children will be a necessity in, in, in a city. I would like to talk about uh, the similarities uh, between uh, sustainable cities on, on the moon and sustainable cities on Earth. If you have, if you have a, a truly sustainable city on Earth, uh, this is the place where you recycle most of your resources, where you have local food production, where you have access to nature. Uh, so the only thing that really differentiates a city on the moon and on Earth that you have a, some sort of gas tight enclosure uh, and some protection from radiation, which we don't need currently on Earth. I would like also to talk about uh, two uh, wide areas of technologies uh, that are necessary on the moon to get more resources, to get abundant resources, and also to use resources more efficiently. Uh, I also would like to point out uh, a good uh, technology that has been developed for space, but uh, has uh, proven beneficial to sustainability on Earth and vice versa. I'll give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. And then my main thing is that we also can see the moon as a driver of uh, innovations for sustainability. Uh, and then my final observation is that we need better cooperation between those who work with sustainability issues for the moon and for space and those who do those things on Earth. So can you all see the next slide? Yes. Good. It's working well. Uh, you can slice all technologies uh, or smart systems in different ways. Uh, in, in many aspects. I think one main thing is uh, that we need more resources on the moon. Or to put it more bluntly, if you don't have resources on the moon, we can't live there. But we also need more resources actually on Earth. And there's a strong interdependence in these developments. But we have to use the resources we have more efficiently. And that points out to recycling or as an, an, as an ultimate system, uh, system for a circular economy, a circular where most of the things are 
uh, recirculated. So speaking about resources, energy is a basic resource. Uh, and actually, there's no such thing as a low energy rich country. Uh, and the need for more energy on Earth is uh, very high. But we need energy also on the moon, in any, just for any, any kind of purpose. And there's a lot of things that could be de developed in space that could provide also energy for, for Earth. Like, and the big promise actually is space-based solar power. Uh, and finally, this is going to happen at least the very first stages. So both uh, JAXA, the Japanese uh, space organization, has worked with space-based solar power for many years, uh, and actually uh, are pioneers here. But also NASA and uh, recently also ESA has uh, done this. And, and uh, this year, you actually have measured uh, uh, significant amounts of energy on from space to Earth. And the basic thing that, that since you have uh, solar uh, power accessible 24-7 in space, if you have a decent position of, of the solar power satellite, uh, you have a, a constant solar power, which, is, which you can't say you have on this planet. And the receiving uh, stations takes up a fairly comparatively small area on Earth, as opposed to traditional Earth-based solar power, which can take up vast amounts of area uh, that could be used for other purposes on this planet. And the receiving station could be placed anywhere. So I think this will uh, come sooner or later, and of course, that will be this will be connected to resources that we can find and use on the moon. Another energy thing that space actually provides us is that many new types of small scale nuclear power is developed for space uh, use, but could easily be adapted both for use on Earth. Here is the NASA thing on the kilopower system, uh, providing heat to a sterling engine that, that uh, drives the turbines and uh, converts the heat to electricity. So that's a few, the few things that I think could be very important uh, energy-wise from space. But speaking about uh, technology for abundance, we don't need only energy, we need uh, food and water and metals uh, and whatever, uh, more and more. And I think uh, precision farming aided by uh, satellites is a very good example on how you could utilize uh, space technology to increase food production. Not too many people know that we have already reached uh, peak farmland on this planet about 10 years ago. But we produce uh, uh, more food than ever. But we still need to produce still more food in order to feed a population uh, that will increase to about 10 billion. Uh, and a population that is getting more and more affluent. Uh, and the growing the grow middle class, especially in Asia, will uh, not be satisfied with, let's say, very small plates. And this is the interesting case, because <laughs> of, uh, of the, the satellite uh, for this purpose has made a pass of, uh, of above the farmer, about 77 miles higher up. Uh, the farmer will receive a detailed map uh, on the nutrient status on all parts of, of the field and could use this map to control the fertilizer spreader uh, and in order to get a, a much 
higher uh, crop harvest. And this example also shows that the uh, the definition or difference between abundant technology for abundance and technology for efficient uh, use of resources is not clear cut. Uh, of course, this gives more food production, but it also saves resources, saves lots of fertilizers, because most of, of, of uh, farms in uh, developed developed countries overfeed uh, their uh, farms, uh, put in more, much more fair fertilizer that is actually necessary for crop growth. But changing the perspective, uh, what could Earth uh, give to the moon that uh, really uh, access more uh, resources? I would say that advanced desalination technologies that we use now to take away the salts from ocean water uh, has lots of different new technologies that could easily be used also on the moon. <laughs> so why is that interesting? You don't have any oceans on the moon. No, but you have uh, lots of ice in the permeated uh, shaded regions. And this uh, ice is hardly, let's say, pure water. It will contain lots of uh, contaminants. And the technology that you use for desalination today on, on Earth could easily be adapted to uh, purify uh, water taken from lunar ice. And now we change to tech category number two, that is systems for recycling in a circular economy. First, we start uh, with some, what is actually a circular economy? Well, it is a thing that you could have to eliminate waste and pollution. And basically, it's about re recycling products, materials, and resource flows. Uh, here we say at their highest value. Take, for instance, uh, organic waste. Uh, instead of making it via uh, 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 fermentation in, into biogas, you can use it to feedstock for, let's say, uh, insects or worms or algae or whatever, and produce new food out of food waste, for instance. That is the reuse at the highest value. It's also possible, a uh, key point is to use less material in products or and in production processes. Take your ordinary beer can. It's about 20% weight uh, or metal in your beer can today than in the beer can for, let's say, 30 years ago. And the final thing is we could, could combine technological and biological solutions, in particular when it comes to treating uh, organic waste or wastewater or to purify air. Lots of cities around the world try to adapt some sort of circular economy uh, as a model. Here is uh, a new part of Stockholm, the Royal Seaport City District, with, with, with this where this has been implemented. The water, energy, and materials are recycled uh, more or less efficiently. Sorry. And if you go into the details, you will see lots of similarities to this. How we try to make closed loop systems for life support. Uh, that, that is one of the basic similarities with uh, circular cities, uh, sustainable cities on Earth and uh, space settlements and moon settlements. But Technology itself, uh, as uh, lots of gadgets, is not uh, the thing we need also only. We need a new smart systems thinking for a city on the moon. We need to connect systems uh, 
that, uh, that has some sort of resource flow to each other. Uh, for instance, you say the waste heat from residential buildings to greenhouses, uh, connecting uh, wastewater to some uh, kind of process that could utilize purified uh, wastewater. We have to see uh, how to use all kind of areas uh, because area is uh, at a premium in a moon settlement. Uh, we have started to, to think on this in, in a few cities uh, on Earth, but on, on, in a moon city that will be that would be much more uh, essential. And of course, we should use all resources in all what we call waste streams. For instance, in wastewater, we should not reuse only the organic as some sort of fertilizer, but also maybe the heat and, of course, the water itself. And you combine technical and biological solutions. Here are some examples of uh, technologies that, that came from space, but uh, have been adopted on Earth. This is a, a Swedish company called Orbital Systems that produce showers. And the key technology in, in this uh, contraption is a filter that was originally existing on the ISS. Uh, this is a nano ceram, a, a, a small, uh, well, a, a filter with very, very small pores. And those pores stop bacteria and even viruses. And together with, with ultraviolet light, uh, the, the water is recycled and getting more clean than tap water. When you start a shower, like, like the, the woman here, this is it's a stand up shower. Uh, and and uh, when the water goes down to your feet, it is uh, purified and reused. Uh, and there's a sensor, say if there's a, a grown person dropping a beer or, or a kid peeing in the shower, the system feels it and, and uh, stops the process and take a new batch uh, from the ordinary water system. So this is not a standalone uh, thing, it is connected to the, to the uh, ordinary water system. And when, when you are finished showering, uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is dropped out. Uh, to the, the ordinary sewage system. But since it's so very efficient, uh, you can uh, use, let's say, five liters of water and get the same effect as 75 liters of water. And that means that you also don't have to yell at your teenage daughters to stop showering for half an hour or more uh, because you don't use that much more water anyway. And this is a big thing and selling quite good. It's a bit expensive. It's around 4,000 euros today. Uh, that's about the same amount in dollars. Uh, but lots of uh, uh, gyms uh, and uh, water spas and, and places like that, and also uh, private owners is adopting this. It's, it's a growing business. Another example uh, coming from space to Earth is uh, the uh, uh, air conditioning system uh, called Sally R in honor of the astronaut Sally R. Uh, also a thing that is adopted and adapted from the ISS. I mean, on the ISS you can't open a window when you want fresh air. So it's a combination of technology and software uh, that saves lots of energy. Uh, also a growing business, uh, but they have a, another good point. They could separate the, the carbon dioxide uh, and use it to feed, for instance, in, in greenhouses or, or uh, uh, indoor vertical farms. I mean, Professional uh, greenhouse growers 
actually fertilize the air with the uh, uh, CO2 taken for, from gas tubes. But here you can use the, the, uh, the, the air that they squinted out on the building to put in, for instance, a greenhouse. That is a bit close. So now we're changing perspective. Lots of things are uh, uh, happening on Earth that certainly could be used also on the moon. For instance, aquaponics, uh, uh, which aquaponics is a combination of aquaculture for fish and hydroponics for plants. And, and you can see the, the uh, schematic here that, that the uh, fish poo and, and effluents are used to, uh, is going uh, into beds where you have inert materials like, uh, like small stones or whatever, uh, where it is decomposed and turned into nutrients for, for the plants. And in this case, uh, shown here in the picture, actually you have tropical fruits uh, grown in uh, Stockholm. That might not sound like a big deal for some of you from warmer countries, but for <laughs> Stockholmers, it is a very big deal to be able to grow tropical fruits in a Nordic country. Uh, and the good thing is that the water is recycled all the time. So only water that leaves the facilities that that water is present in the fish or the bananas or whatever. So I'm sure that this will uh, be a key technology also on uh, a moon base. Another uh, circular technology that we will certainly adopt in, on the moon, but it's already has been present for many years. This is uh, Singapore, where they uh, process uh, wastewater uh, and purify it so much that it could be used as drinking water again. But in order to counteract, they, they say, let's say, yuck factor, uh, they put it uh, in uh, bottles and give it away free to, to uh, Singaporeans and tourists just to promote the concept of uh, making drinking water from processed uh, wastewater. And it's a combination of uh, microfiltration and, and reverse osmosis and of course uh, UV irradiation to kill the germs. Another example, well, you may, might not call this technology, uh, but uh, I see technology is the application of, of natural sciences, human purposes, and you can use lots of uh, uh, organisms and, and trees and plants and animals to pr provide benefit for, for men. Uh, so it's a kind of technology too. Let's call it ecological technology. This is the airport uh, in Changi, airport in Singapore. Uh, very green place and the world's largest, largest indoor waterfall. And urban indoor greenery will be essential on moon uh, settlements. Uh, as Adam said uh, earlier today, uh, you must need uh, access to some sort of nature, uh, and I would say also companion animals, in order to have, let's say, psychological benefits. But this could also be used for controlling temperature and humidity, and also be part of recycling water nutrients, and maybe also producing food, even if this is not, let's say, the national food uh, production areas. But if you have fruit trees or berry bushes or whatever. Uh, there are lots of places uh, where moon settlers could learn from, from the most advanced parts of Earth.
So another perspective of this is that the moon actually is a technology driver. And we have also seen lots of pictures of regolith or dust on the moon. And uh, the, this uh, dust is actually a health hazard. And to counteract it, we need lots of systems to avoid having regolith particles inside moon settlements. And of course, uh, new systems and technologies for this could be adopted to places on Earth that really need uh, to avoid, for instance, uh, asbestos or other uh, dangerous uh, small particles. You can see if you look closely to the astronaut here, you can see how dusty his legs are. The conditions on the moon also uh, will drive new, also new technology to handle uh, thermal management. I mean, from the very hot moon day to the very cold moon night, we need new energy solutions like small uh, model reactors or new solar tech. I'm quite sure that we could be, would be habitats in lava tunnels and other places underground. And of course, that what we will really learn there will also boost innovative underground construction on Earth. We have lots of <laughs> underground space or possible underground space also on this planet. And also a key issue both for energy and health is to have good indoor air quality. And that is also a, a key health issue on Earth. The majority of the people of Earth uh, actually has uh, indoor air quality uh, in urban uh, contexts that are uh, not secure for long time, long term health. And I would say, I would imagine if I would like to make a guess, I would say that around 20,000 persons are working professionally with uh, in situ resource utilization or life support for the moon or other places in space. That's very good. Uh, but I would also guess that around 2 million persons worldwide are working with the very same issues, but for terrestrial applications. That is a factor of 100 times more persons uh, than uh, in space. And because of these similarities between uh, sustainable cities on the moon and, and uh, sustainable cities on Earth, these two groups should cooperate more. And what should we do to provide this? Of course, we should really stress out the similarity of challenges and opportunities. Uh, for an abundant circular economy on Earth and the Moon. And uh, sometimes I would say the space community is a bit uh, inbred uh, and need to look out and take contact with uh, the wider society. We also need to create information resources uh, like Ben's excellent homepage and others for systems that could be useful on the Moon. Uh, and also things that are developed for space that could really be a good thing on Earth. And I think you also should use all uh, budding analog moon habitats uh, that is budding on this planet, for instance, in Laptesk by Niklas. Use them as demo sites and test beds for, for uh, very local food production, in the green year. Recycling and reuse of water, air, and organic waste, and, and also on how to get uh, local resources from the moon. Okay. Uh, so we need more cooperation between uh, space people and, let's say, green tech space people on Earth.
And oh, thank I, you. Yes, I guess that is the conclusion of your talk there. Yes, that's good, because that was exactly 30 minutes. And uh, you're not getting any extra minutes, even though you are giving me a, um, a plug there. And um, so okay. we are we are going directly on to to the next presenter. There are several questions in chat, so please uh, go in there and uh, uh, see if you can uh, reply. Okay, maybe I can answer them in the chat. Yeah, exactly. Please oh, do. Sorry, Niklas, it beats me. I spoke as fast as I could. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, you did it. It was exactly 30 minutes. 